Hello. It's nice to meet you. How's it going, Rachel? Oh, it's going all right. <laughs> How nice about to meet you? you? Too. Good. I'm good. Happy holidays. Yes. Happy holidays. We're almost there. So what brings us together this fateful day? <laughs> Help. Okay. I have reached a point too where like I'm just not sure what to do anymore. I want to so I was like, you'll know what to do. I have two little Chihuahua mutts, a boy and a girl. And they're litter mates. And I have a lot of nieces and nephews. And the boy dog is extremely reactive to only one nephew. We've asked him if something happened. He says no. No one I know who has dogs who's been around them believes him. I don't believe him. I think it was a long time ago. It was when he was little. When Reaper Cheap was, they're five now. But he's like completely and utterly terrified of my nephew. And so I'm doing different things that seem to be helping, but I'm around him a decent amount of the time. And I want to make sure what I'm doing, <laughs> nothing I'm doing is making him more afraid, if that makes okay. sense. I don't want to trigger anything by my reaction to keep him from reacting to be like, yes, you should be afraid of him. And I have some videos I took, but they're not super clear if you don't know Reaper Cheap's behavior ahead of time, but it's, he's always on high alert. If Ari's around, he's, he can't sit still. He'll run and hide. If he's not with me, I have a sling and I'll put him in that. And usually if he's in that, he calms right down and he's much more settled. Uh, but I just, I'm not sure what to do. And this is, he's fleeing every time, not choosing fight or charging or lunging anything like that he'll chase him if he runs okay so the kids decide <laughs> i have 12 i don't remember if i said of 12 he's the oldest and he's 12 so they love my dogs and they started a game of getting them riled up and then running and getting them to chase them which i was not okay with so i've turned it into if they have treats they can show them the treats and then run with the dogs and the dogs have a different behavior when it becomes a treat game. But with Ari, without fail, Reaper Cheap gets low to the ground and is really going at his heels. And I don't see that as play personally. Okay. Yeah, it can be a ton of stuff. It, it may not be rooted in like a narrative. It could, obviously, if he was trying to get the dog to play with him and the dog wasn't feeling it then and he pushed it and he didn't have boundaries most kids don't then the dog could be on their back foot and it could be fear-based conflict issue there uh, it could also just be uh stimulation itself if the 12 year old was too much and loud and moving a whole bunch and that provokes a bit of nervousness from the from your dog then that rehearsed uh, habitual uh, habituated if you will now there is somewhat of a fear response in the present so it could just be overstimulation too you're right in wanting to facilitate sessions where the dog can perceive the child as something different resources are a great way to do that the techniques that I deploy when dogs are routinely, they come to me and they don't know me and they're very scared of me. Very similar thing, just nervous. I'm a large guy. I make myself small and quiet. I don't move. And I give the dog the grace of keeping distance. And I reward the dog at a distance and play pattern games where I'll take something ultra high value. Uh, mackerel lamb or freeze dried whitefish, or you could even go human food and go turkey dogs, deli meat, cube cheese, doesn't matter, rotisserie chicken from Safeway. The higher the value the item, and I'm talking if you can get that dog's eyes dilated and drooling at the smell and taste of this thing, then you will create an event in their mind. And the more you practice this ritual where you create an event and you're non threatening, and you show that you're extremely valuable, you can set the stage for the dog to get curious about you, warm up to you, and make choices to come into your vicinity. And that's the hugest part, is if the dog will actively make a choice to walk towards me, that's consent, that's choice, I'm making pro progress. So that might look a lot like pattern games with rotisserie chicken, Left, dog runs over there, gets it. Right, dog runs over there, gets it. 
until you start pushing it and going left at three fourths of the distance and then half the distance right same thing and now the dog is curious and watching you you can even put sound to it so i'll condition my sound stuff that i'm going to use in the session get it very good get it so that my sound is paired with the yumminess conditioning the tolerance to my sound you don't want to be quiet you want to condition your sound so that later as you get better or as the dog gets more comfortable i then i condition standing up as an okay thing i toss a treat i stand up at the same time i sit back down i didn't go towards you i didn't scare you stand up you're breaking everything up to mean if this is okay in the same light that you might do for like nail trimming, if the dog is particularly terrified of the nail clipper, right? You would break all that up. Nail clipper comes out, treat. Nail clipper goes towards you, treat. Nail clipper goes towards your your hip or your ribs, pull back, treat. Going closer towards the feet, treat. Clipping at making the sound at a distance, treat. Clipping closer, treat. Touching, pulling back, clipping at the nail, not the nail yet, treat. All that stuff gets broken up into microcosms to show like all of these various things are not bad so that you can perform all of it in concert and the dog isn't scared by proximity, by sound, by you standing up. And so that same thing should be repeated as somewhat of a quasi greeting ritual that you're facilitating with the kid in your lap so that there's even more of a reason for uh, the, the dog to come towards you. Once you work that pattern game and the dog walks up to you, then it's about participation. If the dog is listening to me and responding to me, I have a better idea that they're not scared of me. But if they're not listening to me and I say sit and they're just looking at me, then I'm pretty sure there's some drivers in there because they're not participating with me. They're thinking about other things. They're concerned. They're anxious. And so I'll rinse and repeat. All right. Throw the treat over the shoulder. Dog runs away and survives me. Nothing bad happened. He was just in my vicinity and nothing bad happened. And I rinse and repeat until I can get the dog to participate, ask for a sit, and then pay the dog by hand and then throw that treat away and get that dog accustomed to running back up to me. Sit. Here's a treat. Throw it away. Now this dog will run up to the child and has no problem running up to the child because they've done it 10 and 15 times now and it's, everything's fine. Nothing bad happened. And you would work your way to the kids standing up, throwing treats that way. If you wanted to remove yourself from the game, you could put a baby gate up so that the dog feels safe and the kid feels safe. And he would perform the same routine beyond the baby gate. How He's 12, so he can totally participate like this. And now it's minus you and the dog is running up to the kid without the baby gate there. So the thing is safe. They feel a bit more comfortable. And you're performing the same thing until you can remove the baby gate. And he can perform the same thing. And every time that child comes in the room, that child is a treat vending machine. And now that child is the dog's favorite person because no other person is giving them this ultra exclusive high value treat. And the litmus test for their relationship is the dog's willingness to run up and play a game. And the game aspect is extremely important. Right now it's slow and quiet. But later, as the dog gets really comfortable, maybe a little bit more stimulation in there, right? Good boy, good boy, sit, get it. And now the dog is having fun and taking treats at the same time. And you just practice that a little bit. And that will shake the bush when it comes to the stranger danger. We'll just call it a conditioned emotional response. It's not hard to undo a conditioned emotional response. It happens all the time. I remember I walked in one day when my uh, Malinois was an adolescent and he had just eaten the Amazon fire stick remote and it was the replacement that I just bought <laughs> <laughs> and he ate that. And I got so mad. I saw it as I walked in and I saw it like literally right in front of the door in pieces. And I went, are you fucking kidding me? What? I was so pissed. Like I, I wasn't dog trainer mode at that point. I was more like this bozo just ate the replacement it just got here last night i just synced it up and everything and he ate it and me being loud and are you fucking kidding me for the next week every time i walked in the door from groceries or wherever he took the fuck off he ran into the corner i created a conditioned emotional response because i created an event where i yelled when i walked in the door seeing the remote on the ground and so i had to undo that i had to repeat that same scenario 
and bring reward in and get him wagging his tail and making him realize that me walking the door isn't a bad thing. And so what I'm telling you is foundation for, all right, handshake, we're friends again, but you're going to see spurts of nervousness and you're going to want to pay close attention to the scenario that created the nervousness. And then you're going to want to repeat or manufacture those scenarios and bring the game into that scenario. Turn that scenario into, look, the game happens here, treats happen here, everything's fine, so that you can rewrite some of these um, scenarios that make your dog nervous. Because it won't just be about, oh, we're good now. It may have he may have startled the dog when he ran down the stairs one day screaming. And so now you notice that when he's running down the stairs, the dog, even though you just did the greeting ritual that we talked about, the, the report building exercises, you see the dog get nervous and run. Okay, cool. Going down the stairs makes you nervous. Let's rewrite that. Let's remix it. Look, game happens here. Treats happen here. Dog's fine. And just rinse and repeat wherever you see the next pressure point to straight to a peer response. Okay that's helpful we're not around like i'm around him enough but not at the same time like they're in long stretches at a time but they're like months apart and they're in different locations so i'll pay attention to of when he's more reactive ish he does get that what best described as tunnel focus sometimes when he's really barking at him and I have to, like really yell to break it and then he like realizes i'm calling him and then he'll come and i'm like this isn't good i shouldn't have to yell like that to break is this for the kid or is this general reactivity that we're talking about no this is just for ari otherwise it's the yeah, only time he's so ever disobedient. off of me here's a tree i do that in my sessions when they're fixated on me and i can see them loading like they're about to blast off treat i'll use the word even i'll, I'll have a treat bag and i'll shake it most dogs have heard a treat bag before mm -hmm. and they go from, I am about to, I'm about to unload to low. And then I throw a treat and now they're confused. Like, I don't know how to feel. And then I just massage it out a little bit, a couple of repetitions. And now the dog is feeling differently about me. So if you want to break their train of thought, it's far more effective to introduce something that they want, something that drives them wild, if you will than like we would a child that's having a meltdown, you know, in a target because they didn't get a toy, right? Mm -hmm. We're verbal creatures. So we're like, hey, what are you doing? And then children understand that they're in trouble and they look at you. But dogs are are more visual and then the primary visual modality. So the the verbals that you use, oftentimes you have to overcompensate and really get loud and really put emphasis in your tone discerning tones and yelling to break through the noise of them being visually fixated on the thing, the trigger. So oftentimes if you make a noise that is almost impossible for them to ignore, that doesn't have a, pun a punitive connotation to it, you have, you get far farther with honey than you do vinegar. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would do. All you're trying to do is snap him out of that behavior sequence, get him to disengage, come to you into the sit and if you can get good at that, yeah, later you can add some knock it off. But by then you've got the dog disengaging a whole bunch and it's easier for them to disengage. They know you want them running to you. They know what's in it for them if you if they run to you. And then three, four days down the road, you don't have the treats with you. And you hear that and you go, hey, and they snap out of it. And not only do they snap out of it, but they run to you and follow through with those behaviors that you practiced over and over. That's the only reason that you do, you ask a dog to do anything outside after their display is because with practice, with consistent practice of that alternative behavior, we call it, the dog will start performing it automatically. And they're more likely to be able to listen to you because they'll snap out of it. And then that's when you can get the message in, knock it off. But it sounds to me like the first step for you is to make, what's his name again? Ari. Ari to make Ari the most important thing to your dog. That if that is your goal and Ari can be the favorite, then you will watch a lot of this other stuff melt away. Ultra, ultra high value. If you want to go hard, you could do the camera's tracking me and it drives me nuts. If you want to go hard, you can do human food, cube cheese, deli meat. The rotisserie chicken is like about the highest value thing you could imagine. But some dogs go crazy over dog stuff too. If you're uncomfortable with human stuff like beef liver for a dog that if a dog likes beef liver, they love beef liver. Like my Husky will break down a drywall slab for beef liver. 
So I would experiment with what the favorite thing is. And then Ari is the only person that gives that favorite thing. You don't give it. No one else gives it so that they can be ultra valuable. And then make sure that they're participating. Always games and sits and throw the treats. Come, sit, treat, throw it. And just have Ari carry around a little fanny pack with treats everywhere. And you, you could just toss treats around if he wants. But I promise you, you do that and the dust will settle and you can work on some of these. You'll be able to better, once you fix their relationship, you might actually be able to gumshoe the scenario that was the culprit. Because if they have a better relationship and they seemingly are fine and then this one thing happens and the dog goes right back, that was the scenario that probably created the event and the conditioned emotional response. That's good to know. Okay. Yeah, we did prosciutto briefly. They love prosciutto. Who does did that? <laughs> yeah. Was a, they're like really picky and they gobbled it up. And so we did prosciutto for a little while, a while back when if Ari was just, he would woke him up one time because he walked into his room and he was sleeping at night and he just lost it and just barked his head off at him. So we brought out prosciutto and only Ari was allowed to give him prosciutto and he wouldn't take it from him. He had to throw it. And now he'll take cheese from him and sometimes so he'll take normal treats. So the only thing that's missing is creating a pattern over and over and it's not enough to just feed a dog because sometimes a dog and this is a common mistake that even even professionals make even shelter workers that are trying to win dogs over uh, kennel stress dogs they sit in front of the dog and they feed the dog but while the dog is there there's a worry cup if they have a problem with you or they're scared or they don't know you and that worry cup silently fills no matter what you could be feeding the dog but they're still at your um in front of your feet and nervous and so that's where i let the dog shake it off and run away from me so that they can get by running away from me they go i was just there and nothing bad happened and now that pattern of running into my space sitting taking treats creates a sense of security the only foreseeable way to create any sense of security with an animal that doesn't know what the hell's going on is to create a pattern and once they start clocking that there's a pattern and there's a reward, now they go, nothing bad is happening. But in a static position and just looking up at the scary kid, there's no pattern. The dog is still, what happens? There's still a hum of anxiety. And most times it's just the clock is ticking before the dog goes over because the dog is nervous. And it like nerve anxiety for a dog, it doesn't just plateau like us. We have chemicals in our brain, HTP fives, that when we start to feel anxiety, it this chemical releases to where we calm down. Uh, animals don't have the same chemical. Funny fact, teenagers don't have the same chemical either. Ari doesn't have that chemical yet either. Or when, you're, when your teenager kind of goes into the formidable development, they don't have it either. So that's why you see teenagers becoming anxious and not recovering because you develop that chemical later. So the brain chemistry doesn't is not conducive for just sitting there and not knowing what the fuck is going on. So pattern, everything's fine. And you'll start to see the dog feel more comfortable. Make sure that you're mindful of the stimulation that Ari is giving. Sound information, movement information, spatial pressure, towering over. All those things are information flooding into the cerebellum and being distributed across the brain. And if it's too much too soon, almost like a sensitive Richter scale, it'll pass the cerebellum and then it'll go into the amygdala. And the amygdala is the big emotion and fear center of the brain. And then you got the fear response. So you could literally, it literally could have been that Ari was too much one day. It was just too stimulating. And it went into the amygdala and the amygdala went, you should be scared, right? Mm -hmm. So that's just make sure that, you're always conscious of that because when you watch me in sessions on when I'm live with a scared dog, I don't move. I don't make a sound. I don't even look at the dog in the beginning if I feel like they're nervous because fixation can be provoking to a dog. I'll just look away and just toss treats. Everything that, that would show that I'm not even paying attention to you and I'm giving good stuff. And then once that starts working, now I start cluing at the dog and I make perky princess voice, non-threatening inflections and familiar sounds that they like. Treat. Good. Treats. Those are the first sounds that I make, non-threatening sounds. So that's how you do it. And it shouldn't be too hard. So just practice makes perfect. Put a baby gape up when you're not practicing these sessions. Ari's in the kitchen. Uh, your dog is in the kitchen and has their own space. 
And then you don't have to dog on a bone, be like, you don't have to bird dog every interaction to make sure nothing goes wrong because there's management there to make sure like the dog can be cool and Ari's going to leave the dog alone. And then you could take your eyes off the prize when you're not working this stuff like intentionally. I do that with my board and trains. They come in, they're scared. They don't know me. They don't know where we're at. Maybe we did a little bit of warm up sessions, but they get here and they're like, who the fuck, where the fuck am I? Who is that? So when I'm not like, I'm a friend, look at me, look at these games. Dog goes behind the baby gate with my hallway that leads into my garage. And I open my garage so that if they want to leave the hallway and just go lay down on the cot, they can't. I'm not forcing any interaction. And then success for me looks like the dog coming up to the gate and going, what's up? And I'll just drop treats and walk away, create a pattern with keep walking up to them because maybe they're like, oh, he's here now. Treat, walk away. Until when I walk up, they're like, hey, bud. And I'm like, hey, let's go. And I bring them out and I'll take them on a walk. Um, to get them out of that environment. So last thing I would say is like taking them out. If your dog likes walks and excursions, uh, Ari being a part of that is also a, a great way to solidify a bond. Okay. We can do that. As long as it's not raining, that should be fine. Where, where um, do you live? I live in Morgan Hill, but my family, I'll be in Washington state for Christmas with Ari. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> What part of Washington State? Tacoma. Tacoma. I want to move there. Do you? It's getting nicer. Yeah. What's it's the place nice. called? Hickey Up? I, I call it Hickey Up. My wife makes fun of me. It's near Tacoma. Puyallup? Puyallup. That's yeah. it. Pulley Up, I call it. <laughs> I secretly want to move to Tacoma. It looks nice, too. It's beautiful. Oh my God. It's, man. The summers in Washington are where it's at. They really? have the best summers. I When I go home in the summertime, I'm like, I could move back here and remember Christmas. <laughs> snow? It's, well, you don't get that much snow in Tacoma. They've been getting it more the last couple of years. The problem with the snow is that there's always ice under it in Washington. So when it snows, you have to be super careful. It's just like it rains a lot and it's really cold. When I left, I was stationed as a Marine in Hawaii. And I left Hawaii and I moved to downtown Seattle and I was like, I love this place. It's a pocket sized city. You can walk from one end to the other side of the city. And then it, the sun didn't come out for nine months and I went, no, can't do it. So that's why I migrated to California because literally the sun didn't come out for nine months. I just couldn't handle it. Yeah, yeah. it's a lot. But the summers are like just perfect. They're wonderful yeah. up there. Yeah. Uh, one other question about the thing I've been doing uh around this as well i just started doing it this last trip he's he is getting better i can tell every time i'm around ari it's marginally better <laughs> but this last time like they were riding the kids were riding scooters outside and the dogs reepa sheep particularly really doesn't like the scooters and so what i did was i had him sitting with me and he was either on the ground or in my lap and then i had treats with me and when i knew they were farther away i would have him do something like touch and give him a treat and then when they came by i figured out which part scared him the most where they were when they did a loop around ish where we were sitting and then when it came to the part he was reacting the most to um i would have him do the touch then or around when they were coming by and giving him the treats to try and help distract him from when they were doing that but i didn't know I, he seemed like hit and miss i made sure he, i wasn't asking him to do something with his back to it because that's when he was like really not engaging but as soon as i had it where like his back wasn't to them he was engaging more and then doing more for the treats is that okay to be doing or yeah if the treats are there to influence the dog uh, and do somewhat have a calming effect if you're not too close but really the dog getting into a like an output or performative place at a, a distance and then clocking into the scary thing and then having fun and then clocking in almost like in the beginning, it would be like a 80, 20 ratio of having, it's all about you and what you're doing. And then every once in a while, he'll clock into the scary thing. If you can create fun around those scary things then you can rewrite the scary, and then you would just look to go closer and closer. But by then the dog is enjoying the transaction and whatever you're doing. And it, that will help buffer some of the fear drivers you just want to be mindful. I would look thing. I would look at things in terms of sensory. So if the dog is fixated on the scooter or skateboards, you can that's trigger seeking, and they're just waiting to get closer 
or they're just following it until they finally go over. Maybe just based on proximity, they'll go over. But if your dog is interested in you and having a good time, and then they hear the skateboard hit a ramp or somebody does a you know trick or something, and it makes a sound and they go like that, then you know it has more to do with the sound. That helps you figure out your distance because you understand what the what aspects of the trigger are driving the behavior. It's not just the trigger. It has to do with what areas of the brain can't tolerate that information. Typically for dogs that are fixated, I'll, hey, come over here and Dix, I'll teach them to focus on me more and condition them to focus on me more. And then when they go to look at the thing and they want to just continue to fixate and be tense, I'll ask them not to and come on me so that they are not trigger seeking as a default. But if it's sound, then I'm being more conscious of the sound coming from the park or the skate, the scooter and helping to get closer and closer until they can tolerate that sound movement as well. Walking and traveling can alleviate some of the concerns. Sometimes it's too much to just sit there. So when I have dogs that are fearful of skateboards and scooters, I have a community park here that it's my place to go because it has a dog park next to the skate park. And I will perform what I refer to as an environmental pattern game where I will put the dog way far out in the middle of a soccer field and I'm tossing treats and they're on a long line and they're having a good time. And then we'll start traveling closer until I see that they're like, holy shit, what's that? But just catching eye to it. And I'll play a little bit of game right there and then we'll survive it. So the only thing that dog experienced was game, having a good time. What the hell is that? Ah, game continues having a good time. We survived it. And then I would do it until I can see the dog is comfortable at a distance, at a closer distance. Once the dog is comfortable at a distance, right at the edge where they're like, oh, this is fine. I can see it, but I'm not nervous. I plant it and I just hang out and I let them watch and catalog. The more they catalog this outlier in the environment, the more the outlier can be the baseline. So sometimes it's just about exposure work for them to go, okay, that sound is fine. Nothing bad's happening. I can tolerate it. I'm watching it. But if you go past that point and if they're scared and nervous and you start to see them ramp over, you're probably too close or you probably need to do a little bit more of the environmental pattern games going in, going out, going in, going out. You can also walk on the outskirts you being in travel, the environment is stimulating and you're, it's changing. The scenery is changing as you're traveling. So a lot of dogs do better when they're walking. So you want to look at that too. But by the time I've massaged it for an, a session, I'll stay out there for a long time. After an hour of doing this, we'll be right up against the skate park and I'll sit on the bleachers and I'll just throw treats every once in a while and I'll let them clock it. And they'll just sit there and watch these things go by. And then pretty soon when the new scary thing becomes old news, like you're past it, but it's, it is the long road. As a dog trainer, I'm paid to fix the dog and placing the dog over threshold and allowing the dog to rehearse the reactivity that I'm paid to fix is counterintuitive. So I have to put the exposure in. So the dog goes, by the time this yo -ho, this Yahoo hands handed me back, we were out there for five straight days for hours and now I'm perfectly fine with it. That has staying power than me coming in like a trainer and going, hey, like how, knock it off or whatever. All that stuff might work with me after he goes, that sucked, I'm not gonna do that. But it would come down to the owners replicating that and doing things that obviously they sh they would have done if they were going to do them before they called me. So exposure work, pattern games, Take slow is smooth and smooth is fast when it comes to fear. That's the bottom line, right? Take yourself a roadie. You know, it's fucking cold, so figure that out. Bundle up. But you should go out there with the sole purpose of having a good time. Bring a partner, bring a friend, bring a couple cans of wine, whatever you want to do, and just make it an event and give the dog the exposure that they need to go. Got it. Check. It's not that big of a deal. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, and that's like a very environmental pattern game. Envi environmental um, patterning is I do that for a lot of stuff. I do that for dogs that are scared of cars and noisy sidewalks. We get a lot of transplants here, people that lived in Arizona. And then mom took a job at Kaiser Permanente in downtown San Francisco and surprised this Australian shepherd can't tolerate it. Mm -hmm. And so I will do the same thing, but just busy sidewalks. We're on a quiet side street, you're sniffing, and then we walk into chaos, we play some games, and then we get out of there and you survived it. And then you go, okay. But the dog 
being having a little bit of fun and focusing on me is what helps them realize like nothing bad is going to happen. If you allow them to just fixate on all the scary things, they have no assurance that nothing bad is going to happen. They're waiting for something bad to happen. So that means you're too close and you're allowing the dog to be danger close and be nervous about those things. So survive it, come out, go back in. Thank you. You're so welcome. If you have any issues with it, or if you're like, this sucks, it's not as easy as he said, <laughs> you can just send me the videos and I'll see what's going on. And I it's have right there right next to you. And I can say, okay, try this, try that. Uh, are you a part of the community? Yes, I am. I okay. just joined, I think, last week. Okay. I have some stuff I can post you post for you. I have a fearful chihuahua sorry chow puppy that's scared to death of the kid in the home and we worked it i have three sessions where i can show you what it looks like and that may give you a better sense of how i facilitate the stuff so i'll pull that video and try to get it together for you thank you yeah, yeah. real fear case that puppy she embraced the mom for the first time and the mom started crying in the session. The puppy's so scared of the home, scared of the dad, scared of the kid, that it wasn't showing any sort of affection. It was just scared all the time. So you'll see what it means to like literally, you could hear a, a leaf hit the ground. That's how quiet we're being in the session. Wow. Yeah. Do you know, this would be a question for you. So they said, um, so last year, so they live in LA area, my, the Ari and his family. And so I go down there quite a bit to visit them. And last year I took each of the kids individually to Disneyland for their birthday slash Christmas present. And they said, my sister said, when I was gone, they were better with Ari or he was better with Ari because Scout doesn't mind him. She barks only because he's barking. Sometimes the owner is a nook for the fear issue so sometimes you're simply a corner for the dog to retreat into and the dog is not likely to leave your leave you because they feel safe around you so you're a corner and that's where you see a lot of dogs sparking up and charging from the owner's feet and all these different things as opposed to take off and go hide in the kitchen is that they feel they're scared so they retreat into you because you're your safety for them your home plate and then because they're not going to leave you, you might as well just consider it a corner and the dog is just blasted off at your feet because it's get away from us, get away from us. So that's probably more what it is. You also, it could be circumstantial, like sometimes the circumstance or the scenario itself, because it's been practiced so much, will drive the behavior. If look, everything looks the same and sounds the same, and this is typically the part where he gets scared and, and sparks up, then it will become somewhat of a ritual. What so a ritual. you not, so being, you not there being there doesn't look or sound the same. You're gone. It's a completely different scenario versus I'm scared. I'm at mom. Here comes that thing again. This is where I it, – it, dogs are very – contextual creatures like it's and here i do this is typically how it works for their behavior so that's probably all it is it, okay. it's not you it's just context okay i was like am yeah. i cultivating this and that's why he's better when i'm not around no it's just more of the you're the cubby hole for him to run to you and then from there he goes up this is the part where i do this and he's just stuck in a rut that's it I will get a little treat bag that I can have Ari wear <laughs> at Christmas. Super high value. Don't go prosciutto. That's a lot of sodium. Yeah. Uh, test out some turkey dogs. Foster Farms turkey dogs are even more healthy than the regular hot dogs. I hate for your dog to plump up oh, in the middle of the holidays. Oh, and, and the sodium intake for a lot of those processed meats are pretty gnarly. But you could also go freeze-dried white fish beef liver i would try those two things out they're like polar opposites of each other one is pungent and one is more hearty to dogs so one typically i see dogs like one versus the other they go crazy over one versus the other you said it was freeze-dried white fish uh -huh, so pungent okay. anything pungent okay the, it, the if you're worried about the the because when i get freeze-dried white fish they're really high in calories and really high in saturated fats and if you in a fear session where you're trying to just treat Santa Claus, the kid like mm -hmm. that dog can really pack away a pat, like a lot, lot of treats, which is obviously going to mess up their stomach and everything. 
So yeah. that's why I switched to the Zwi Macro Lamb because it's just as pungent, but I can give a million treats and the dog is, it's not going to mess up their, their stomach or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. I'll look into that then. Yeah. Cause they're really picky about their treats. They'll only eat very few things. So I buy, they really like the, when it's just like jerky chicken breast. Oh, good. Like their favorite. That's perfect. So I do that a lot, but for high, for a higher reward than that, I do, I try to vary it because I don't like to give them too much cheese either. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it'll be cheese and usually it's only Ari and he's only allowed to give a little bit. And so we try to switch it up, but I've been trying to find something else. Cause yeah, the prosciutto, I was like, they can have a little of that. They can't have a lot of that. Of something Sometimes else. it's, if it's a good thing, then the problem is that it's too much of a good thing. So you could even go like that really thinly sliced cheese, the kind you would spread on a, a burrito. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I'm talking okay. about? Like the fine cheese and literally you could just toss a couple of those and uh, no harm, no foul versus having to sit there and micro cut up prosciutto or cut up cheese. Okay. I would do that fine grade cheese. You would probably have a lot of luck with. Okay. And then the Zwi is the, they have little ones is what you're saying? Yeah, it's all little. Yeah, okay. it's a dog food that is extremely pungent, extremely high value. It's made with a whole prey ingredient, so it's really healthy. And the mackerel lamb recipe is what I train off of uh, because it's literally the highest value thing that I've ever found. And they it just so happened that they reached out to me and gave me a discount code because I kept talking about it. If you put in Canine Optima 20 and you get a bag that's over $50, you can get like a five pound bag and that'll last you forever. You'll get a 20% off and free shipping if it's over $50 and that bag will go the distance you versus you start using some of the other treats out there, even the beef liver and the free fried the free fried fish that I'm talking about. I could go through a bag in a session because they're just gigantic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I will try all of that. Thank you. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. Use the community to keep this conversation alive. Now that I know about your circumstance, when you send me stuff, it's a much easier conversation with, all right, here's what I would do next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And I'll try to make sure I record some of what I'm doing with him as well in case like things aren't going as well and be like, this is what we've been doing. What do yeah. we need to change? Yeah. Uh, because yeah, I can entice Ari in a few ways to really engage more in the training. He gets like distracted, especially when the other nieces and nephews are around because he wants to play with his cousins, but I'll have some time where they won't be around. And so I'm going to try to, milk that for all it's worth <laughs> yeah, and get yeah. to do some things and the other kids love the dog so if they can see it as a game too and oh yeah let's see how Ari does this time and stuff I might be able to get more of that going yeah that's it that's it I mostly I always say to the clients send me videos of things going right and send me videos of things going wrong and that really can help me understand like where you're at what you're currently dealing with both good and bad okay I yeah. will try to do both of those. <laughs> All right. Thanks. You're so welcome. Any other questions? I don't think so. Those are my main ones. I think I have a session with you on Saturday in person for my girl. Oh, you're here. Yeah. yeah. I haven't left yet. I leave on Sunday. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Oh, so I can assess it. That's perfect. Yeah. So you can look. I, I'll bring Reaper Cheap too, so you can look at him. I'm hoping they'll take his stitches out on Friday. We'll find out on Friday at the vet. He had a little lump removed behind his ear, so he has a little cone on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Let me. That's perfect. So we'll put some kids in front of them and see what sparks. I'll be able to assess what the uh, fear issue is if they're coming in person. That's fantastic. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to do virtual to talk to you about that. And then I had some questions about Scout and I was like, let's do in person and we'll see if we achieve well enough to come participate. But I yeah. think he will be. Yeah. It's so smart because I can just get to work. I'll know exactly what's going on. So it puts a lot of the session to use versus having to take the intake for the first 20 to 30 minutes. So this it's fantastic. Yeah. So it'll be easier and you'll be able to see him and his happiness but also his fear <laughs> yeah don't worry i have some really obnoxious kids myself so we've got you came to the right house stress them out the right house don't you worry <laughs> i got them all you take your pick i'll bring them out you could just take a pick between the nine-year-old the 12-year-old the 14-year-old the 16-year-old yeah <laughs> they can rile them up yeah <laughs> oh. awesome i will see you saturday then okay perfect we'll see you uh, tomorrow oh cool okay.
So they live, he's down in Southern California. So. Okay. Yeah, he'll be there, and then I'll see him again in January. You going uh, family stuff? Yeah, family Christmas stuff. So we'll let them, if they want to go somewhere, let them go there. We'll let them sniff the spot out. Okay. Um, uh. Uh. The, so they tend to be... Okay. Got it. And Maybe, uh, what do you think that is? Do you think it's a source of security and that kind of gives them, to, it lets them be uh, emboldened enough to create the displays? It's okay. It's like the tiniest little poops ever. He pooped before, so this is like the red mist does not come out. He just started just pooping in threes. Oh, nice. Is there a lie? That I think that it was frustrating uh. <laughs> when I'm watching them. I'm not sure what it is because, um, like, even with three strangers, like, if they go up to a stranger, um, they'll bark, bark, bark. If I pick him up, quiet, and she has, she greets people just fine. So. She? Yeah, like, she'll, they'll both go up to greet someone. Sure. And they'll be barking and kind of crazy. If I just pick him up, it's like, he gets quiet, she settles, and then she'll So she's high. feeding off a hand. She, he probably starts barking, and yeah. then she just, she, it's called social facilitation. Yeah. Dogs mimicking the behavioral cues of other dogs. Okay. Much like, like a, what might be referred to, which is an outdated, like, you know, coin of phrase, but like pack mentality, like a dog charges a dog and all of a sudden the other dogs in the dog park see it and they all start charging but it's just social facilitation okay. so um that that's good so at least you know who your culprit is yeah um and does how does he recover from like once you put him down he's fine or um he's calmer once i put him down he'll still bark a bit and be a little more intense than she's being but then he settles faster if i've held him for a minute does he get to a place where he's like what's up bro and like enjoy per a person or does he just tolerate them um, no, he seems to enjoy them. He doesn't always know, like, they'll get excited and run up to someone. And then they don't always know how to, like, accept the attention from someone. They don't know. Okay. You want that treat? Oh, my God. Look how adorable her face is. Oh, she's so cute. She just looks at you like she's lived a thousand lives. I went for her, and then they had him as well. And I didn't know you aren't really supposed to get little mates, so I took both of them. Huh. Is this what you want? Oh, you want oh, you got the good stuff, huh? Yeah, I brought the chicken just in case. My dog is there. Okay. So let's see if I toss it, if it's just about me. Not entirely fearful of me. I am sitting down. We are quiet, but I mean close proximity to me so not stranger danger in terms of like a default driver that where she's always there yeah. I would imagine if I stood up she would uh, he would take a couple steps back um, but dogs that are um, somewhat of a significant fear towards strangers will not walk into the this kind of space they won't get this close they're on guard they're behind you they're next to you they keep checking in to see what we're doing uh, he's not doing that at all. He's just checking checking the spot out. So this is a new place. I'm a stranger. Mm -hmm. So the you know the issues that you're having with uh, the nephew mm -hmm. um, haven't aren't a general issue. I mean, he hasn't generalized to different environments. Now I'm going to get him comfortable and a little bit more confident, uh, and then I'm going to shop him with the nine year old to see with that confidence do we see an upfront issue. Whether or not we elicit the behavior here doesn't matter. I'm still going to show you some greeting rituals to give him, you know, a different perspective like we talked about on the virtual okay. and have him see people differently. And you might want to up it. I mean, if he's getting this routinely, this is chicken jerky, mm -hmm. um, you might want to go something. You want to find the, you know, filet mignon of the dog, you know, treat or human food world. So he gets super excited, and that excitement can change how he feels about strangers. Like sometimes it's 
It depends on the dog. Like if I see a lack of confidence, uh, let's just put it this way. Whatever the dog loves the most, I try to marry with the stranger. So like the last dog that we had, Tucker, did have a fear response with people, um, but he loved his butt being scratched. So we kind of did some exposure work and got him comfortable with greeting people, like tossing treats and not, you know, getting in his space so that he got comfortable enough to come up. And then I actually had strangers start a greeting ritual of scratching his butt. But that was his, like, heroin. He, could, he loved it so much. Okay. He would become completely <laughs> different and, like, super excited that they're doing that, even though he was just trying to fur muscle and bite everybody. So with the board and train, we kind of applied it like that. So his roadmap looks different because, like, scratches are his little, like, crack cocaine. So you want to find your dog's crack cocaine. It may not be scratches. It could be a tree. It could be... You know, some dogs are toy obsessed and the person delivers the toy and now that you know person is the furthest thing from a threat because they're offering the favorite thing but also you're changing the thoughts with uh, you know him interacting and participating with that thing and then you're changing the feelings because the dog is relatively excited about what's happening you do that consistently as a greeting ritual and you can build a new outlook on people with consistency so that might mean you manufacture the, the introductions for the next couple weeks. You know, you're going to have a good opportunity because you have friend family over. Mm -hmm. So what a wonderful time to be like, and this person's awesome, and this person's awesome. And it's kind of what happens in my board and train. I do the same thing. And by the time the dog leaves a two-week process, they've met 30 people, and all those 30 people are awesome. And that has a better chance of generalizing to other environments because it's a nice foundation. Yeah, they're just straight up staring you down with those treats. <laughs> Let's see if I'll take it from you. It's like it's got his stench on it. No. I'm also wearing this one. You're not getting in the swing, baby. You want to try this one? And did you happen to pick up the uh, baby gate thing we were talking about? Uh, my mom has one at her house. Oh, good, good, good. Because of the little kids, she has one. Okay. So I have one I can sit at. Yeah. <clears throat> and then something okay. comfy beyond that baby gate bed? Uh, yeah, I have beds up there and um, blankets that they like. Cool. That's perfect. Yeah. Now they got a home plate and it's nice and cozy. Mm -hmm. They've got their space. If the house erupts and you're not far enough in the process for them to be comfortable with what's going on, they've got their space and it's super nice and comfy. But also, they're still exposed to it. That's the most important thing. A lot of people move straight to like crating their dog. What in the world is going on? Uh, it just gave us an age restriction. Somebody reported this is, uh, yeah, yeah. Somebody reported this live as uh, not appropriate for younger audiences. So we just got like a quasi violation. Whoever you are, just go away. Do me a favor. <laughs> like, just that's not cool. Just stop trolling. Um, <clears throat> so the most important piece is that the dog gets some exposure in a safe way, right? It, it's counterintuitive to lock your dog away. If that's all that you got going on and you're not, you know, trying to make a, a, a step or a stride in the process with some exposure work, then yeah, maybe, you know, putting them in a crate somewhere is fine. But in terms of like, we got to get through this, we got to help them feel comfortable about people coming over. Yeah. The next logical step would be they're watching, they're listening cataloging everything and then it can take these sounds in this movement and they can start to catalog it as baseline not you know um, an exception right and that's kind of how dogs operate in terms of fear is that something is in contrast in a behavior a contrast in a person's behavior which is why kids are alarming to dogs mm -hmm. because adults act a certain way and then kids come around and the dog is like they don't respect my boundaries they're loud they're running this thing <laughs> Tiny drunk humans, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, so that's where the exposure piece comes into play. And then the great thing that happens too is if you've got something that the dog absolutely loves, then they can, you can, what I typically do is I set the deli meat on the 
dining room table. And whenever my friend, my kids are bringing over kids that my Malinois doesn't know, I mean, immediately when I go to the, the fridge and I put it on the dining room table, he, because of the amount of times we've done it, he knows that a stranger is going to come through the door and he knows that that stranger is going to start tossing deli meat. And so it, it gives a handshake right away. So now we're at a place where they can do it once and give him some deli meat. They have him sit so he's participating with them like Malinois should. And then I can let him out from the baby gate and he goes up and he sniffs them and he, they're in. Next time they come over, he's, what's up? You know, so, but that's just with being consistent with this ritual, the structure, and how you're introducing people into the home. And if it looks the same and it sounds the same and it's the same sequence, then the dog has a sense of security that treats are coming, this person isn't a threat, I know what's going to happen, and that sense of security can mitigate a lot of the fear. Okay. But if you don't have a pattern going on and people coming over and it's like cocktails here and barbecues here and it's a big party, yeah, dogs are going to be taken back by that for sure. Yeah, super nervous, huh? Yeah. Would it be okay to take them off leash? Sometimes they're different off leash. Uh, well, is it, are they a flight risk or uh, they're not leaving your side? <laughs> okay, go. I can walk them off leash and they're like, boom. Um, right, let me, know. before you take them off leash, let me uh, grab grab that seat over there and put it to the far corner of the garage here. Just go sit it over there. And let me introduce a kid now and see how they are. Leave and pull the kid out. And then as they get more comfortable, I'll reintroduce to see if they're going to present out of fear in a new place or present out of uh, confidence in being here for a minute. <clears throat> Yeah. That's perfect. Okay. Go ahead and have a seat so they know you're not going anywhere and they start to settle. There you go. She starts to shake off a little bit. Good. They keep waiting for pets and treats, which is fine. Go ahead and don't give me any treats right now. Yeah, because then that'll they'll stop engaging with everything else. Harris, yeah. can I get your help? Yeah. Uh, this this dog charges kids, nephews in the home. You got your shoes? Yeah. Okay. I just want to see if they uh, they charge you on site, just being a kid. Okay, new character entered the room. Go ahead and walk up to that set patch right there. Go ahead and walk up right there. Stay out of range, but walk on that patch right there. I'm going to get out of the frame so I can see that they're focusing on him. Walk closer. Okay. Looks like you do a lot of engagement, disengagement. They immediately disengage and look at you for treats. Yeah, that's good. I can tell you've conditioned to check in, so that's great. Uh, Paris, run back and forth this way. Okay, stop. Let's see how long it takes to recover. Turn, a, turn away from them, look that way. Turn back and look at them. Turn around. Be right back. Okay. 
Gonna up the reinforcement. So not barking at me. Paris, go ahead and take position again. Oh, he's right there. Okay. Let them know he's here. Hey, hey Dad. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm helping draw. Just one second. For this session. Just one second. Okay. Go ahead and start walking back and forth this way. Just move a little bit. Keep going. The what? It's not a Nintendo college. Okay, cool. It's like it's a CPU TikTok algorithm. Okay. Go ahead and run back and forth. Okay, stop. Stop. Hey. That's it. That's enough. So you could take the microphone pretty easily. They're not out of control, they're vocalizing. So this is uh, this is expression. Uh, if they weren't on the lead, this one definitely would charge. You kind of saw the first time he went forward before he even started barking. Um, so they're not completely out of control. They're literally just in a bit of a display right now. Hey, uh -uh. Now I want to communicate that I don't want them barking. Since they're communicating, then I can communicate to them, almost just have a conversation with them. Out of control dogs, you can't do that. Like, you can't take the microphone. They're not listening. There's auditory exclusion, typically, sometimes. And it's so much harder to get a word in edgewise. But these dogs are totally able to listen to you. And you can, like, interrupt them and say, hey, uh-uh. And then ask them to do something else and then pay for that something else. Okay. All right, Paris, run back and forth. <laughs> hey, shh, 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 shh. Okay, pot, stop, Paris. Can you sit? Can you sit? Oh, look at it. See, you did so good. Can you sit? Your sister had some. Do you want some? Not a fish fan? Your sister is. Your sister's a big time fish fan. Your sister had some. Do you want some? Not a fish fan? Your sister is. Your sister's a big time fish fan. Um, and that's probably just from having un, like untethered access or a, be able to run towards something. Maybe there was a cause effect where the kids ran and then he got emboldened and kept doing it. Well, they, it's what I'm trying to undo is they really like the dogs chasing them. So they like jump to get them amped and then run with the dogs chasing them. Do they bark just like that when they amp them? Yeah. Okay. They so yeah. Lot, yeah. They so conditioned it. Yeah, You're good. Like okay. Huh? Okay. Well, you, of course, you're the star. All right, your dad's waiting. Go ahead, buddy. Thank, thank you. Hey. Uh-uh. No, no. Come here. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Almost there. You're thinking about it. Big sniffer, though. He likes to sniff. So, yeah, that if it's a conditioned response, then it's very superficial. And that would be why I can like say, hey, and they stop mid bark, mid alert bark and look at me. They stop to smell the roses, if you will, the fishy roses. Um, that would suggest that it's very superficial. So you just have like a conditioned response. That's it. You just need to condition a new response and help them calm down and then just communicate to them not to do it. You just, you know, interruption cues can be as soft as, hey, something that distinct that you gets them to stop their behavior mm -hmm. and you can ramp it from there depending on the situation ah, like whatever that looks like but for these dogs that's not needed there because it's just very they're just kind of they're going through the motions okay. there's no real driver here okay. there's no adrenaline there's no fear there's no it's just like this is what happens when things run around this is what we do it's conditioned okay that's, it's been yeah. better once i started giving the kids and they have to like run with the trees and they're silent and they run just fine you may that's difficult to do because then you have to you have to separate out you don't want them uh barking but then you also can condition the response when things start moving so if it becomes a game um it would be preferable to bring the training into that chase me game so that you can get some sits and recalls hey because every time something's moving fast that's what they do now 
So you want them listening and not just full throttling around the house. Um, otherwise, you got to work. It, it, it's a uh, you're at the edge of that sort of over threshold cliff, right? All it takes is a little bit of startlement. I don't think that's a word, startlement. <laughs> Let's just pretend it is for a second. All, right. All it takes is for them to be taken by surprise by that movement, and then you have a conditioned response to them taking off after it, but now they're not playing. And so that can accidentally condition a charge and or a nip. Okay. <clears throat> Typically in my board and train process or in, in sessions, when a dog is choosing fight, um, I'll condition some recalls, some place in, some disengaging, so that if the dog starts following through with that, or when the dog starts following through with that uh, default behavior, it's to take space, not move forward. That's the you know the, the thing that you want to build in versus you know run towards the thing because then you know it just takes them being over the threshold and that's it. They're gonna bite. So I, the, the thing that will solve this would be the nephew being how old? 12. 12? Oh, that's great. He's just going to be the trainer. So recalls, hand signals, luring. The 12-year-old is going to be the resident dog trainer. And then that's the game that you play so that they start listening and they enjoy the company. Um, and if he's going to run around, put an ask on the end of that. So instead of it being a conditioned chase me game, have them run across the room and ask for them to come to him and sit and get a treat so that they're listening and clocking and engaging versus, you know, output, not listening and yeah. losing control a little bit. Okay. Hi, sweetheart. I'll take this one, though. Okay. Oh, my God. How old is she? They're five. Five? Yeah. Why do they look? They just got salt and pepper then. Yeah, they uh, their hair has just continuously changed since puppyhood. Every year and a half, it shifts a little. So it's just a little bit of gray mixed in with the white, making it look like more gray than it is. Mm -hmm. They're young mm -hmm. and just so small. Okay. Um, they don't. I didn't socialize them well. Okay. I didn't really know what I was doing. And they were really sick when I got them and I didn't know. And the vet had me like freaked out to bring them around other dogs. That I would get other dogs sick, which I had learned more about. And I, know. I didn't have to be that cautious. But like, he does a little better with other dogs than she does. But is there any way to help encourage them to play? Because it's like a random dog she'll just love and suddenly like she'll go and want to play with a random dog and there's only been a handful ever that she's been exposed to that it's like instant she wants to go play with that dog do you feel comfortable with like some of the stuff we talked about already you feel like you got it um like greeting rituals get the kids training and you do you want to move into like an assessment cat uh part of this and we pull some dogs yeah. out and see what happens yeah, okay and you feel like that you want to assess their behavior while they're together yeah okay. i can do it together or separate but they're usually together they're usually together perfect yeah. okay yeah go ahead and uh take them out to the tree right here on the sidewalk so they don't see the helper dog <clears throat> my helper dog's dying to come out so Where's the Frenchie? Oh, there she is. Hey. Okay. It's funny. Boo wears her Christmas collar year-round, so... Yeah, she always wears the Christmas collar, but now it's actually Christmas. <laughs> That's it. What? She wears it all year round. It's got candy canes on it. It says boo. Uh huh. <laughs> oh, yeah.
Okay. So she's the nervous one? He's better? He usually does better. Okay, I'll take her. And then we'll just assess together. Actually, I'll just take both of them. I'll let you keep the freeze-dried fish. You want their chicken feet? Uh, not yet. Might pull it out. Let's go. And then you can walk with me. They'll probably stick close to you. Come on, mama. Let's go. Okay. Doesn't see her. She sees her. He sees her. Don't do well with dog. Got it. That tends to be more for is she is she big in their eyes? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so she's alert alerting. Take him. He keeps shaking it off. Is that because of the cone? Yeah, I think that's okay. Keep him there. They're both shaking it off. Come on. Come here. Hi, sweetie. What do you think? What do you think? Oh, this is just excitement. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? What are you thinking? Hi, sweetie. Everything's okay. Oh, baby girl. Oh, baby girl. Wanna go say hi? Come on, let's go. Come on. Mm -hmm. Go back to mom. Come on. Let's go back to mom. Swap you out. Come on over here, Huffer Puffer. Come on. Go. Come on. Come on. Go. Go ahead and walk forward, mom. Okay. Come on. Right about there. Hi, buddy. Hi, sweetie. Oh my goodness, you're such a sweetheart. You're such a sweetheart. You're such a sweetheart. Hi. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? Hmm? Very easy to comfort, very easy to, I mean, it's, it's unique that you can calm a dog that easily in the face of a brand new dog in a new environment, even more so with me being a new person. Mm -hmm. Like they are very um, easily influenced and calmed. Yeah. Um, and maybe some, some light pets, some compression pets can do the trick. He seems to really like it. He's kind of leaning into it. Mm -hmm. Um, but essentially, they're just it's, there's an uncertainty with dogs, and they're not sure what to do, and they you can kind of see it that sort of fervent like, ah, ah, what do I do? What do I do? So yeah, maybe a little bit of exposure and some greeting rituals might actually help so that they can kind of follow through with a sequence because I'm not seeing fear, I'm not seeing reactivity, I'm just seeing uncertainty with a little bit of stimulation. So we can give them some context and foundation for like, hey, everything's fine, check it out, it's just a dog. So I've been, so I've been taking them to the dog park in Morgan Hill, and then I'll just sit with them, depending on who's there. It depends on the dogs and the people I know that are in there. Uh -huh. Often I sit in a chair that's higher up, and they sit with me, and when he gets confident, he'll sit with me at first, and then if there's dogs, he knows he'll jump down, and he'll go kind of play a little, and then he'll come back and sit in my lap. She never chooses to get down, ever. Yeah, if it's between you and the dogs, that, that'll never work. If I bring a dog that, like like when I'm doing socialization for my board and train, the more I involve myself, the less likely the dog is going to take a chance, be curious, and dive in, right? Okay. So maybe um, not sitting, standing in the corner, not paying much attention to them unless you need to calm them. If they feel like they're a little uncertain or a little uncomfortable, for sure, involve yourself. But if she's presenting as somewhat curious, then let her let her do her thing because it's the transaction with the dog and the exposure with the dog that's going to help her move forward in the process. Okay. Once she starts to place more value with these interactions, these successful interactions, then she starts to enjoy it and she's less, uh, you know, put on her back foot about it. Okay. Sweetheart, hi, sweetheart, huh? Hi, sweetheart. 
Yeah, they look older because of the salt and pepper. Mm-hmm. And they're I guess they're just so small that you can kind of see. It looks mm-hmm. frail, but it's just that they're small, not old. Yeah. I don't work a lot of small dogs. No, I've I mean, noticed. I watch your live streams. I was like, I don't see any small dogs in there very often. I guess last time I got bit, it's because I just didn't like, I, it's tiny little French. Who cares? I'm like, yeah, I got you. I got you yeah, he's like, I'll show you what's up. Tore my finger apart. They are pretty good with the kids. And like, even if they get stressed, like, one, they never bite. He has warning nipped the air by one of my nieces who kept doing what I told him not to do. And my sister has a dog who has bit one of her kids before. And she was like, no, Lisa wasn't obeying. And I kept telling her, don't do that. <laughs> He'll bite you. And sure enough, he did it, then she stopped. But with mine, he's only nipped twice in the air at one of them, and then they, like, finally are like, oh, I can't, like, lay on top of him. Yeah. And after that, like, she still loves him, and they're fine. I've had, like, babies grab them, like, their skin and yank, and they just, like, look at me like, just call me. Yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. And it's like, it's okay, it's okay. And then I, like, give them a treat and, like, comfort them, like, it's okay, and then they're fine. Yeah. So they don't generally react, react that way. But he does, like, my friend has a dog, a puppy. He does not like her. She's very high energy, and she's learning not to jump and stuff. But he really goes after her. But she comes the puppy. Here. That's mm-hmm. very that's very standard. Is that it, standard? It, a lot of puppies, just like with children, it's a similar scenario if you really think about it. This thing, this entity, doesn't have any respect for boundaries. Is very stimulating, running, making sounds. Uh, And that will cause a reaction in a dog. Some dogs, you know, will choose flight and go flee and hide in the corner. And some dogs, you know, will create a display to push the thing back so they leave them alone. And then some dogs uh, might correct and bite the thing to say, stop doing what you're doing. And then some dogs, as a means of correcting, might lose control and attack and go over threshold, like areas of the brain responsible for aggression sort of activate and what might have been a dog you know, advocating for themselves or correcting goes out of control. So it's a mixture of performance. It's dog dependent, but very common. So um, dogs like Boo and the dogs in my program, they've learned to teach dogs and not hurt them. Very expressive. Boo is a great dog to help a puppy out because she's a mama dog. She's a husky. They have a wide vocabulary. And she does so many different things to say don't, 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 don't without hurting the dog she's actually very similar to me as a trainer <laughs> like, like just communicating very like i put her in front of really crazy dogs and for 45 minutes they were like mounting her going crazy and she just kept staying consistent would knock it off and finally the dog got it um so that's kind of the name of the game is making sure that um you're if they don't want that puppy in their lap and they're just not the type of dog that can corral a puppy or wants to engage with the puppy then you just don't want them to have access at all because they're going to advocate for themselves so they either we advocate for them and get the puppy to leave them alone or they do what's you know perfectly suitable in the animal world which is like tell the dog to knock it off they don't have hands and thumbs they've got teeth to do that yeah Let me close that gate. Take this. Don't pet boo, whatever you do. and drop the leash. Who come? Come. So I just use a treat bag to interrupt that little quick little huff before it became a puff, Uh right? Catch the huff before a puff. What, you want one? Okay.
No, just sniff it. God, she's adorable. What is her name? Scout. Scout? Mm -hmm. Oh, God. It's a good name, too. Mm -hmm. And his name? Rikichi. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I feel it. I feel it. It's the mouse from Narnia. It's like my favorite. Oh character. my god, okay. Reaper Cheap is the mouse's name? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but she's actually he's trying to like be a little deputy sheriff for her. Hey. Hey. Uh -uh. So very subtle. Like just breaking that little signal. Let's not go there. I'm establishing a little boundary there, like brick by brick. And I'll let I'll let him actually elicit the behavior. As much as we need to, she's being fine. She's not being out of control. So if he starts to vocalize and growl, then one more brick. Okay. Uh -uh. Right? Stay consistent with your communication. It doesn't matter what you say as long as it's consistent. Okay. And then he does it again. Another brick. And pretty soon you got 10, 12, 15 bricks, and then he stops. Okay. She also, like, if she's in the swing at the dog park, because she's, and he's actually playing. Sometimes if he's really playing, she'll she'll do the same thing. Like she'll yeah. start really barking. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, no, no, it's okay. Fun, please. Yeah. yeah, fun, please. So yeah, you would call her off and just hey, come here, and just teach her you don't want that. Just intervene mm -hmm. and help her out with that. And with enough consistency, like exposing her and trying to get those behaviors, you want repetition. In um, you want like successive repetition. You can't. If it's one here and then two months later you do it again and three months later you do it again, that's not a learning event for a dog. You're just hitting the pause on the behavior. So a dog trainer systematically creates the behavior and goes, not here, so that through a learning event and a couple sessions, the dog goes, okay, got it. And 10, 15 repetitions in two sessions really means something to the dog. Come on, boo-boo. But yeah, she's pretty adventurous, this one. Mm -hmm. He's... He keeps checking in on her. Yeah. That's a sis. Mama, come. Boo boo. Boo boo. Treat. Let's go. Treat. Come. Ooh, heel. Wow. Who's fancy? Huh? Who's fancy? Spin. Wow. Look at you, huh? I'm trying to see if her stimulation. Makes them uh, alert bark. Spin. Spin. Guard. No, that's good. So nothing from a sensory thing. Come on, come. Go ahead and uh, grab the leashes and go back to the corner of the boarding train. Mama, come. Boo, in. Come on. Let's go, in. Get your butt inside. Come on, let's go. Go, in. All the way. Hi, Gigi. You know your you know your next. Okay. What time is it, kids? Eleven. What? Eleven. Eleven. Okay. She doing okay? Yeah. What did you do? Okay, bigger dog. So if there's some threat detection going on, then you're going to see a lot of barking. The reason we know it will be threat detection is because she is less stimulating. She doesn't move around. She doesn't engage. So when a dog goes off on her, it's primarily due to size. Hi, sweeties. Oh, forgot this fish. Want to try the pit chicken? You don't discriminate? Hmm. Yeah. All right, let's go. You want to walk with me? Let's go. There you go. Oh. Oh, it's the sweetest. It's the sweetest. Oof, 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 oof. 
What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, your sister's way over here. Go ahead and step forward. There you go. Yeah, not totally worried about her, so that's good. You see how I have to take a knee a little bit? Like, remember that they're tiny, tiny creatures in a giant's world. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Was it like a black widow? You saved my life. All right, have fun, bud. Yeah, you guys are picky. Gigi, come. Hey. Mellow out. Food monger. Gigi, come. Come. Come here. Just huffs. Okay. Talk to the talk to the huff, and you'll mitigate the puff. And we'll just say the puff is like puffy chest running towards the dog. But just ha enter the conversation. It doesn't need to be punitive. Obviously, you can communicate. I'm being very delicate because I'm a kind of an X factor. I'm a stranger. They're still a little alarmed by me. I'm a big guy, so I have to you know really dither it down. But um, you, you can just plainly speak to them. But just make sure that you're consistent with the sounds that you make so that those sounds, with being well-timed, start to mean something in these scenarios. Okay. So like, a, hey, it should get them to look at you. And that means you interrupted the, the um, behavior sequence, if you will, the display. Okay. And then, you know, have them sit, calm them down, give them some treats. It's cold. She can shake on cue. I had to learn that one. She's very good at manipulating. Oh, really? Yes, she is. She'll shake for treats? Sometimes. Like, she'll shake if she wants attention and she doesn't feel like she's getting what she wants. Oh, it's like the, uh, did you ever watch Puss, Puss in Boots? No, I didn't see it. That's where he, like, his oh, eyes dilate. <laughs> She'll also try to like climb up on your shoulder and like nuzzle in. Aww. And I'm like, no, no. I'm just nuzzling. Aww. I don't want to do it. That's adorable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not in outwardly social. Curious. Wanted to sniff, and that's about it. But not, you know, not reactive at all. Not aggressive. Um, you know, ignoring her does, in dog to dog, it does sort of send a message that they're not interested. So that's why Boo did a play bow and they just ignored her. And then she went on to smelling that literally the conversation was, you guys want to play? And they said, no. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, cool. They didn't reciprocate. That's what a, that's what play invitation does. It's meant to, you know, start an interaction. But when a dog just shows intentional disinterest when they play bow and looks this way, the dog goes, got it. Then for the dogs that don't understand the etiquette and they press forward and charge, well, now they're met with the animal advocating and correcting them. Yeah, okay. That's good. Yeah. You go to small dog parks? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't go to the big dogs. 
and I'm cautious in the small dog. I'm careful. That's why I keep track of the people I know and the dogs. I know. Yeah. Off hours, I imagine, in a small dog park would be pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty nice. I've taken them in when I knew no one was in there um, also and, like, walked them around and, like, tried to get them to play in there just so they got used to the space without any dogs. And yeah. And it didn't really seem to Do they play a lot? Them. Yeah, they play a lot together. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, if they're if you're exposing them and you're just not seeing much, maybe it's something very fleeting and that's it, and you've done it for you know a while now, then they're probably just not pro-social. They're not outwardly social towards stranger dogs to the extent that stranger dogs are play partners right off the bat. Um, you should see uh, the warm-up period change. You should see that yesterday was fun. I liked it. We had a good time today. They're a little bit more overt about it. They're a little bit more outgoing because they're excited to play. But if you don't see that and you see hesitation and you've been doing some tempered exposure work, mm-hmm. it's probably just not in the cards for them. Okay. And that's that's very terrier too sometimes. Okay. Yeah. He loves when dogs run. Yeah. He loves it. That's, that's, that's very terrier too sometimes. Okay. Yeah. He loves when dogs run. Yeah. He loves it. That's Dude, that's not play. Okay. Yeah. Anytime it's play, typically it's 50-50. You chase me, I'll chase you. But if you see a dog pursuing and then they try to, you know, uh, flip the coin and that dog is like, F this, I'm out of here, then that's just pursuit. That's just a biological drive to chase something that is running. Same way that a dog would chase a ball. Um, Come on, Gigi. Uni. Come on, Uni. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Let's go, everybody. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> Louie, come here. Ugh. See her? This is Sweet Pea. She's a foster. Want to see what? She's less respectful of the dog's boundaries because she's older. She'll just come up and sniff, and um, I want to see how they would respond to that. Sweetheart. Yeah, no, it's just a uh, alert barking. There's no real drivers there. She's just expressing herself. So you can cap it, tell her not to. Okay. Uh, place her in circumstances where you know the behavior will happen, and then just just work it for a little bit, and it'll go away. Okay. More or less teaching like a tempering cue. Just say stop barking when I say stop barking. Uh, you could practice on the doorbell and apply the language on the doorbell, so you can get a ton of reps in if they bark when the doorbell goes off. Okay. Yeah, you can practice that. Hit it. Hey. 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 Relax. Relax. Relax, kiddo. And I'll bend down and get in their field of frame. A lot of owners, when they're trying to teach their dog something or tell their dog to stop barking, they don't pop in their visual frame and get their total attention. But that's the spark that turns to flame for getting a dog to disengage from that. 
is engaging with you with a little bit of duration to fully disengage from that behavior. Okay. As opposed to standing back on the end of the lead and trying to communicate, you know, four feet away. Okay. Uh, and that, that will be the transition for them fully listening to you and doing things for you, sitting, relaxing, all those things. And that also gives me an opportunity to calm them. So as I'm talking to them, sorry, sweetheart, I'm going to stare with you. Um, I, can, I can compression pet. I can compression pet and all those things. Hey. This is the sweetest dog in the world, guys. My ex has a really sweet husky, and she desperately wants to play with him. And she's pretty good at that. Hey. Hey. Enough. Hey. Enough. So you would time out the, I mean, the petting and the soothing tones that you're using are good for calming if you notice their little heart rate's going and the respiratory system's going. And then the, the real communication comes with distinct, like, interruptions, well-timed interruptions when they start barking. So you would wait for that. And sometimes if you're over-communicating those sustained tones and they're not relatively excited or out of control, you can't draw sharp contrast with those distinct communications. So silence and well-timed interruption is a more efficient means of interrupting something. Okay. So yes, like sustained tones, calming tones, pets, when they're completely, you know, um, in a tizzy, but once they calm down and they're focusing on you, pick your moment, get quiet, wait for them to start barking, and communicate. Sometimes I'll snap my fingers as I communicate. Anything I can do to be, to, to be compelling and unique in my communication to help them out with don't do it. I'm talking to you. But most important thing, just don't invoke fear or startle them because that's counterintuitive to calming them down. So it's just plain communication with quick, distinct sounds that suggest that you are don't want it. And what suggests that is interrupting it. Almost like if you and I were talking and I cut you off, you know, hey, actually, I wanted to tell you, you know what? That's fine. It's a uh, turf. Come on, old lady. Let's go. Let's go. <sighs> She's been here for seven months. If you ever wondered how bad the landscape is in rescue, this sweet girl can't find a home with a person who has a half a million platform. <laughs> That's how bad rescue is. Hi guys, you did so good. What? Huh? You did so good. You feel you feel good? Yeah. You're on the community, right? Yeah. So when you go to do this stuff, work it. Get somebody to film what you're doing. Yeah. Send me videos of things going right. Okay. And send me videos of things going wrong so I can help you adjust if it's not working. Okay. Right? Um, and that way it's almost like I'm in the same room with you and I can coach you as if we were in a session at your mom's house. Okay. Okay. Some videos. But I would not categorize them as pro-social at this point. Yeah. I just don't see it. Maybe in a uh, full immersion kind of scenario where I put them, bring them in the home, but they might end up just hanging out with my terrier on the bed where my terrier doesn't want to be around all the dogs either. Mm -hmm. She'd prefer to sleep and not be in the mix. Yeah, that would be them. Except for the random dogs they love. Yeah. Affiliated with. Maybe. Sometimes it's strange dogs. Strange dogs? I've never seen Chloe come in. And I'm learning some of them. They tend to be Chihuahua mixes or Chihuahuas because they're a lot Chihuahua. Like, that's kind of random. But I can kind of tell, like, oh, they might like that one. And sometimes... Usually he's the one quicker to be like go up to one that I'm pretty sure they'll like. But there have been a few like one random one came in the other day we've never met before, and she was like over play bowing trying to play. Oh, okay, yeah, like, could be yeah. You know the uh, somebody reminds you of your best friend. Yeah. You know yeah I can see that. that you see more, sometimes like that like huskies are very much known to like be enthralled when they see another husky. Oh, okay. Um, so it might just come down to like some visual association. And sometimes dogs that look like their best friend or look like the type of dog they played with in the past, they can 
absolutely go there. Comparative to the dogs that they've never seen before, the bigger dogs, the you know big two coat German Shepherds, those are in contrast with all the dogs that they like or play with, and so because of that, you see a different behavior. Yeah. Hi. Do you want a treat? All right. Well, thank you so much. You're so welcome. They were wonderful. Very helpful. I'm so happy to hear that. I'm trying things. And a couple of days, we went there. Yeah, keep me close. Send me yeah. some videos. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'm help you. planning on where I'm going to like, put them in the house. Yeah, and <laughs> see if you can find some good stuff. Switch it up. Don't bring the jerky, t the, t the chicken jerky. Yeah. Go hard. Go cube cheese. Go something crazy. Okay. Experiment. Yeah. Turkey dogs, slice them up super tiny. And just experiment with stuff that they're like, oh, shit, this is amazing. You bring that into new circumstances and watch. It's almost a, a shortcut. Okay. Yeah. You can throw it on the skate ramp. <laughs>